But if you have these people in your corner with you, you have a plan, this is how we're going to grow together. You'll know if they step up and be like, this is what we're going to do the contract. And be like, cool, we think we can kill it. That gives us more incentive. Or like, mm, we just want to take our fees. Like, we're just interested in that. Like, you have a pretty clear indication of how they run their business. Welcome to the Cashflow Chronicles. I'm your host, Johnny Catani, and the founder of Catani Capital Group. For the last two years, I've been studying alternative assets and now help solve the problem of creating passive cash flow for creators, influencers, and busy professionals by bringing you five episodes a week of easy to understand education in the world of passive investing. What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Chronicles. I'm your host, Johnny Catani, and I'm joined today by Ben Nelson. Ben is a world record producer turned syndicator. He's a friend of the show. He's a friend of mine. He's in our hearts forever. Ben, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks, man. The, the feeling is very mutual, I'm sure. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. Uh, we're grateful to have you. Uh, yeah. We obviously connect. Well, we've known each other for a bit, but we connected at Rays Fest back yeah. in January. Uh, romped around Louisville, if that's a thing. Um, it was a thing. I remember most of it. Yeah. <laughs> It was a great night, a uh, great weekend, but, um, you know, very vague on your intro here. So I'm sure the listeners are very intrigued. Give us, you know, kind of your backstory. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I produced events for a very long time. Um, was fortunate enough to get in at a time where action sports really started to blow up. Um, and we're and work with clients that were doing some really inventive and uh, forward looking things and some really difficult things. And we were able to, to jump in. So yeah, I, I moved around a lot. I was able to live in New York City. Um, I'm born and raised in Colorado, but really started my journey in, in production by moving to New York City when I was young and just to see if I could do it and put myself in a place where I didn't know anything about it. I thought I wanted to produce events. So I started the, at the ground level on, in fashion shows, believe it or not, and just started at the very bottom, carrying stuff around. I was just the grunt kid uh, as a PA um, and worked my way up and was able to work on some really amazing things there. But it really, you know, it wasn't my space. Uh, I, I proved to myself that I could do something hard, something I didn't know about and learn it. Uh, but then moved back into action sports, got to know a lot of the Red Bull guys in New York City and, and some people doing some things adjacent in that space as well. And um, we're really fortunate. We got asked to do some projects. Um, we broke some world records uh, over the years and just kind of kept niching down into really weird hard, difficult outdoor action sports events. Um, spent a bunch of time, got into racing. Um, we produced a bunch of races and, you know, uh, got in working with a good buddy of mine who moved over to Nitro Circus, um, did some, some work there, um, but really was on the road. I've got two little boys. Um, almost everything we were producing was, was somewhere else. So I make this joke that I was always building something for somebody somewhere else and really didn't spend any time at home. You know, I kind of this running joke, like, you know, Hey, you live in Colorado. I was like, well, my wife and my stuff lives in Colorado. You know what I mean? Which is great. And we, I love the space. I still love the space. I love producing. I still produce. Um, but it, was, it came time where I realized that when my boys are getting older, I'm on the road for literally weeks at a time, missing summers, missing birthday parties, missing 4th of July. Um, it's time to make a choice, right? And I understood that it, my family was my, the most important thing to me. Um, I, just, I love producing. I still do. <clears throat> I still have tons of friends in this space. Um, so we, my brother and I had... Uh, invested in some small real estate things uh, in Texas. We had a couple of quads and um, my brother, Eric, who started Wild Oak, uh, which is, I'm a partner in Wild Oak with him. He, he kind of came in, he's like, hey man, your skill set really matches what I think we can do here. Let's, let's take a look at syndication. Um, so last race I produced, I was in New York City for literally weeks at a time. And again, missed 4th of July. Um, and that's when we really made the, the decision to make the switch and make the jump. Um, mostly because I also realized how many people in that space, and not even just production, but just in, the world of events or production or art or people who are on the road, how much time is spent just building in and throwing yourself into these projects and how much, and I, I mean, same thing. Like I would run people who love them. I have friends who still just bleed into these things because they love that space, but either a aren't looking forward or just don't have the time to look forward. Or maybe you're putting some money into a 401k or something else. I realized how much I could help people that were just like me build into the space and actually grow a future for themselves and their family and still get to do what they love to do. So that's kind of become my mission is there's so many people that just don't have either a access or B just don't know about the multifamily space and how powerful it can be. Even if you're just investing passively, especially if you're investing passively to grow your wealth, grow your, grow your income, grow your future for your kids, your family, whatever else that might be. So in a nutshell, that's how I jumped on here. That's awesome. I love it. That's incredible. And what a wild story, right? Like you 
were nowhere near real estate and then kind of just it is fascinating to hear people's stories and kind of how they discover it that's why i like to ask because yeah. you know you have your classic like oh came from entrepreneur or you know had real estate in my family forever and then you know you have this kind of these um these outliers so now that you're in it yeah what uh you know obviously things are getting kind of kind of wild economically uh <laughs> yeah. banks are collapsing the whole world is coming to an end everything is over yeah <laughs> everything you thought you knew no uh this is a really uh it's funny the all these things start to happen right like stock markets crash cryptos getting dragged through the mud although had a bit of a rally from the stock from the right. bank collapse the banks are collapsing and people are now I think going to be more attentive to listening to other ways to preserve their money. Right Yeah. now you don't think of an investment and also preservation, but as syndicators, that's something that, you know, a good syndicator, good operator sponsor is going to focus on is capital preservation. So what are some things that you're focusing on now kind of moving forward, yeah. um, you know, with investors and also with the deals that you're doing? Well, you hit the nail on the head. And just to, to kind of bring it back to people in the event space, right? So when COVID is also a really good example. Like we just kind of had these hits that keep coming, right? Like COVID, the entire event industry shut down. And that was a huge wake up call for me as well. It's like on the backside of that, having cash flow, having cash producing assets that are as a backstop for what we're doing is really important. And we're seeing a lot of that now. So recording in March, 2023, to your point, banks are collapsing, you know, the Fed's trying to figure out what to do, they keep hiking rates, but now there's kind of this pause, right? And everybody's waiting to see what's going to happen. And if they do have to take a step back, what does that do to inflation, right? So what we're talking about right now is exactly that. It's like, you can be on the road, you can be working, even if you have jobs, jobs look great right now, knock on wood, people are still spending money in for the most part. But if they have to take a step back, and there's inflation, and inflation continues to rise, Multifamily real estate is actually a fantastic place to be. If you're investing in real estate, and especially because multifamily usually pegs at least to the CPI, the value of that real estate is going to continue to grow. So if you have the ability to put into that, if you have the ability to invest into that, that's what we're talking about. So people that I'm that I'm working with, it's like, hey, you're in a volatile industry anyway, right? Like events come and go. You have to be really, you know, you have to be fortified against what that means. Let me help you show, let me show you a couple other ways besides just a, a 401k or a savings account. Like let's go grow something. And I think that's the difference here is there's the ability to grow in almost every environment. This environment, although scary, and yes, the world is ending and chicken little is having a heyday. Like you, there's an ability here to do some real good for your family. If you're working with the right people and you're paying attention to the right things. Totally. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. It's, you know, it feels like no, nobody knows what to do, but in reality, you know, there are things and, you know, those of us who invest in real estate are kind of licking our chops, right? For multiple reasons, like you mentioned, you know, when you're invested in these, really these hard assets, right? It's, it's what it's really about. You know, you're mm -hmm. going to get that appreciation, you know, you know, there's, there's predictability, right? And although, you know, things may be slowing down a little bit economically. It's nothing. I mean, you know, aside from maybe some bad debt, there's really not anything that crazy, you know, happening. Yeah. I think every like everything is happening to everybody all at, as is, as it is now, right? So right. also as a student of history, just reading books. Like there's, I'm reading this book right now, and it's actually about you know, fe weirdly, weirdly nerdy. It's like feudal Japan, but like, and then as it came out and then it opened up to the West and there's a segment in there is talking about the 1860s and the U S is going through a civil war and, you know, things are happening in Europe and like the entire world seems like it's on the brink. Everybody made like tomorrow is going to come tomorrow, no matter what the sun's going to rise tomorrow is going to come. So the best thing that we can possibly do in my opinion is not freak out, like be informed, ask questions, but also take it with a grain of salt and look at both sides and make a plan. There's a pathway here. There's multiple pathways here for people to not only a succeed, but succeed well and to grow. And I think that's what we're, we're going to continue to focus on. You know, it is going to be interesting. Things are going to change. Some people are going to win. Some people are going to lose. You know, that's again, we investing is a risk. It always is. But if you have the right people and you're asking the right questions, it doesn't have to be the sky is falling. It just has to be what do we think is going to happen and how can we best 
put ourselves in a place to succeed in that space. Tomorrow's going to come. I'm going to say it again. Tomorrow, no matter what, tomorrow's going to come. With barring some, you know, catastrophic asteroid, right? It's going to happen. We'll be fine. Absolutely. And I'm sure there's some people, you know, maybe the CEO of some former collapsed banks that wouldn't mind if an asteroid <laughs> came down <laughs> at this point. Well, that's it. Uh, Everything seems heavy. Everything seems heavy when you're in it, right? Yes. But a little bit of perspective. Yeah, it is fascinating. You know, um, my um, my girlfriend and I talk about this all the time. Like kind of, you know, when you're in that low and how, you know, oh, a year from now, we're going to look back and laugh at this moment. And it's true, right? And sometimes it doesn't even take that long, but um, it really is about that perspective. So kind of digging into your portfolio, what yeah. what does it look like? What markets are you in? Um, sure. Yeah, so we, we syndicate, we are value add. Um, so we primarily focus in Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, um, and really what that has come out of more than anything else is really great partnerships. Like we, we have some excellent, excellent partners as far as PMs are concerned for so property managers. And so we, we found a couple of these niches. We found some places that we really like. We like the economics We're Tulsa is a great, uh, one for us as well. We, but we just really love the people we work with. And that is the biggest thing for us, especially, you know, I've worked my entire career in events and now in, in syndication, working at a distance and having to really build a strong partnership with people at a distance. Like, hey, this is, what this is what we're experiencing. This is what we're experiencing locally, whether it be a storm or the roof or just tenants or any of these other things that you're working with, the ability to build these things up and to have a really strong conversation and to be able to asset manage from a distance requires strong partnerships. Um, so that's that's really where we're at and we're looking to grow. Um, but we are sort of following along and partnering with our PMs. And when we kind of expand, if it's into a new neighborhood or into an adjacent market, or you know, we looked at a couple other markets that we think are going to be really strong in both Arkansas and Oklahoma that are secondary and tertiary, it's in conjunction with our PMs um, and making sure that they have boots on the ground, that we have the right people in the right place. Texas is interesting, but I think, you know, everybody's getting into Texas. We've got some uh, stuff in San Antonio that we really like. It's an interesting market. It's a growing market. Um, but right now, Tulsa and, and Little Rock are just our, our primary focus. Yeah, I've heard that of with both Tulsa and Little Rock, as well as San Antonio. You know, uh, last week was the best ever real estate conference. Obviously, a lot of uh, syndicators there. San Antonio came up a few times as kind of up and coming Heard Tulsa, actually heard Little Rock, but it still feels like it's kind of floats under the radar. What what's competition seem like there? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of local competition, and Little Rock, just like anywhere else, is really pocketed, right? Like you have to understand where the neighborhoods are. We were super fortunate in the sense that, you know, we have one of our partners, Shane, is just a rock star. That guy digs deals out of out of somewhere. I honestly don't know, but he <laughs> found an amazing one for us. It's a quite literally like the classic, like, you know, C plus B property in an A-class neighborhood. Um, it's a little bit older. It was owned by a guy who had it forever. Like all it checked all the boxes for us. And so we got into that space and looking around, you know, we've looked at probably 15, 20 other properties in Little Rock that we've passed on or just didn't work. Um, so I think that to your point, it's growing. And I think there's a lot there. And depending on, you know, what people want to see from that real estate come out, we we're actively buying there, but we're actively looking at some of the other surrounding areas as well. That's awesome. I love it. And what has, you know, obviously it's like we mentioned earlier, a bit, a bit interesting economically. Are you seeing a slowdown in deal flow? You know, are you still finding yeah. stuff that can pencil? You know, I know there's always deals to be had, right? Like, right. You, you know, you go to these conferences and you listen to, you know, I, I love uh, Neil Bawa, great guy. But, you know, you listen to some of these economists and it's like, all right, why am I even in this industry? You know what I mean? <laughs> but then you talk to operators and syndicators and they're still doing deals. Yeah. So no deals uh, are out there. It is yes. harder. But I also think that it's again, it's the through the perspective of time, right? For the last couple of years, anybody could throw a rock at the wall and make a deal work because it was just on such a crazy escalator ride. So yeah, I think there is a correction. There's a correction happening. We're all seeing it. Deals are harder to find. Deals are harder to pencil. It, it is this sort of leveling of where sellers want to be and where the money can actually buy at this point too, because we're just seeing such a difference. And I think the reality is, you know, being, I, I'm not the future teller. Like I'm, you know, I'm not an economist myself, but being realistic about it, are we ever going to get back to like sub threes? Like probably not. Like that was just a gimme for a lot of yeah. people. 
Yeah. But if we get into sixes and you can see some stuff, the pencils, and you have some realistic conversation with some, some sellers, I think that what we're seeing is there's also a lot of sellers that know this game well enough to understand that either we have to figure out owner carry, we've got to figure out other ways of making this attainable. Is it there yet? No, not, not totally. In a lot of markets, there's still a lot of people who have a lot of money. They're throwing things at the wall, you know, and I think so hopefully some people can make that work. We're cash flow play people. Like we love the appreciation. We love that, like sitting on that, but that's not where we're going. We want to make sure that from day one that we're cash flowing, that we have the ability to do that and that we have enough runway to make this work for us and our investors longer term. So same thing. Like you hear this, everybody's conservative in their pitch, right? Like we're a conservative underwriting, X, Y, and Z. It's a matter of what does that look like, not just on three, but five, on seven, and on 10, if you have to sit on this. And I think that's where we see a lot of people, like you start looking at people's numbers and they're still pretty thin. So people want to make a deal work, but the desire to make a deal work and what that actually looks like at year three, five, seven, and 10, especially if some things go sideways, that's where we have, where we spend a bunch of time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned kind of owner carry. You're starting to see some creative financing again, talk to some some uh, syndicators who were using uh, owner carry, obviously assumptions are huge right now. When you talk to lenders, they're, you know, got assumptions coming out their ears, it feels like. Yeah. So, you know, deals are still getting done, right? It's just a matter of, like you said, you know, you can't just throw a rock at a wall and, and 2X your money in 18 right. months anymore. Right. You've got to actually have good underwriting, you know, a good business plan and implement that business plan, a good team. Sounds like you guys do. Uh, any, you know, thought about bringing some of the verticals in house or, you know, what is kind of, yeah, we've had conversations about it. And I think that's, that is something that we're looking at longer term. Um, we, we do have a great team and we are looking to grow and we're looking to grow pretty quickly, uh, sustainably, but we, we believe that we have the componentry to do a really good job, frankly. But right now, what that vertically looks like, we are we want to work with the right people. So the, the speed to get to vertical integration is less so than it is like we have amazing property manager teams in place that we work with. And right now the economics work for both of us, right? So a big thing for, for me especially is the way that we have conversations with our property managers at the outset, but also through and looking at pro forma and like, where are we hitting? Where are we missing? Where are we, where are we working out? And also incentivizing. So the property managers making money as we grow also, right? So there's a lot of, kind of lower hanging fruit. And I've, I've gone through the good and the bad, even when we were working with our quads, we've had to fire property managers. It's never fun, but I think a lot of it comes back to the leadership and the ownership of, of the uh, GP or like the sponsorship group saying, this is what we expect. Here's how we do it. And also here's how we grow together. And I, what I mean by that is structuring your contracts in such a way that it's not just fee on fee on fee, right? So, so many of these property management uh, contracts were like, well, we'll take that. We'll take a fee up front, and we'll take fifty percent of the first month. And then, if there's a late fee, we'll take that. And if there's X, then we'll take that. And if they sneeze weird, we'll take that fee. Like that's how they're making their money, and it it doesn't work, right? Because it doesn't incentivize them to actually do a good job. So what we do is we build an escalator. We're like this is where we're at. This is where we think we're going to go based on pro forma. And if, as the more we grow, the more you grow. So it incentivizes based on. So all the fees go into the pot, so they get a split of that too but we're not incentivizing based on fees. We're incentivized based on performance. And I think that is a really, really key thing that especially early syndicators miss just like signing the contract. I mean, we're, we were guilty of it as like personally in the beginning, like you don't know what you don't know. I'm super savvy with contracts, but that was one thing is like, I'm never doing it that way again. Interesting. That's a fascinating perspective for sure. Uh, because you do hear a lot of just like, Oh, you know, 7% of the gross boom, you know, sign on the line. And off you go, but it sounds like when you kind of dig deep and, and kind of touch on that, then what some of those contracts looks like and what most, well, I should say what you were dealing with in the beginning in terms of like what they were trying to, to take. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it comes from just lining things out. It's easier if you can build something and you, and in my opinion, you'll get a pretty good idea of how well they think they do their job based on that. If they say, yep, we have this property. I mean, we're also cards on the table people, right? Like we want you to dig in with us and we, we do our due diligence. We want you to like see the good, bad, and the ugly. We don't want to have, so I mean, there's always going to be a surprise. And I think that's where a lot of also people get, get tripped up. It's like, oh, here's the plan. It's going to go exactly to plan. Like something's going to go wrong. It will. 
no matter what. You're going to find something you didn't know about. You're going to find something maybe even the owner didn't know about. Something's going to happen. But if you have these people in your corner with you, you have a plan. This is how we're going to grow together. You'll know if they step up and be like, this is what we're going to do the contract. And be like, cool. We think we can kill it. That gives us more incentive. Or like, mm, we just want to take our fees. Like, we're just interested in that. Like, we have a pretty clear indication of how they run their business. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a great perspective and, and great insight. I appreciate that. Um, that's another one of those kind of nuance, right? Like you said, kind of sometimes got to learn those the hard way. Um, also, you know, partnering, right? Experienced yeah. people. Those are kind of the things you learn. So now as we kind of head to the year, uh, what it sounds like a lot of opportunities could be presenting themselves, you know, yeah. some, some funky debt out there, obviously. Um, is that a main focus for you guys is focusing on good debt? Have you always focused on that? Do you have yeah. any floating rate debt out nope. there? We do not. We focus on long-term debt for, uh, for several reasons. You know, we've been, we've been really fortunate in the sense that we have taken over. We've um, assumed a loan. We've assumed loans for, for some of our properties. It is a painful process, but it is entirely worth it. And I think looking long-term, you know, we love working with local banks. We love working with some of those things, but floating rate for, I mean, and it's a great tool for certain people, but for right now and for what we're looking at, just again, we look at three, five, seven, ten. We, if we have an exit at three, cool, but there's a very decent chance. We might have to hold on to this for five, for seven. Like that's that's really why we get into some of this longer term debt too, is that we have multiple strategies that we can employ. We don't want to just be stuck. Like we have to get out at three. That's, in my opinion, it's a pretty dangerous move. It's worked for some people, but it works when the tide was in, right? Like when tide starts to go out, you see people that are in a little bit of trouble. I, yep. I do think that it will get figured out. There's enough debt coming due and there's enough properties out there. And there's also enough people buying that are in our position that I do think that it will get worked out. Again, this, the sky is falling. I think some people probably got in over their head with multiple, multiple, multiple floating rate debt um, procedures that they just have on multiple properties. Um, and they may take a little bit of a bath, but we're also in a position where like, hey, we can come in, we'll structure some debt. We'll, we'll bring in some people, like we can figure out how to lift this property up. Um, we like that. There's a lot of these properties that had big grandiose plans. And now all of a sudden the debt is way more expensive. So they can't service that debt or even using what all the capital they had assigned to projects perhaps that now has to service that. Um, so we think there's some opportunities there to, to get some people out of trouble, but we also think there's some opportunities to come in and do a lot of good for some investors. Yeah, absolutely. You said a lot of great things there. Love your guys' uh, perspective on debt. You know, that's a thing. Obviously now, right? Like you mentioned, a lot of operators learning the hard way. What happens, you know, when you over lever? Now, to their defense, right? Nobody could foresee. I don't care how good of an economist you are. Nobody could yep. foresee interest rates doubling in basically eighteen months, right? So, very challenging variable. Um, at best ever, I heard of one group that uh, had done three deals, and unfortunately, I'm probably going to have to exit all three. Yep. You know, not didn't dig super deep. Um, not sure what's going to happen with investor capital, but you know, yeah, uh, it's happening. Well, the good news is that highly, unless you're just way, way off the rails, highly likely most people aren't going to lose a bunch of money, right? They're yeah. just not going to make money, and that's the that is really important delineator. Yep. Also, if you get really deep and you're losing money, something went way off the rails, but likely you're just not going to make the return that you wanted. You know, so a lot of these assets, if you're buying right, like you make your money on the buy, if you're buying right, and even if you have floating rate debt, there's a there's a chance that you're probably at least going to be able to resell for a, a, approximately what you got it for, hopefully. And which is a great deal. Like that's where somebody like you and I are going to come in and be like, yes, we will take that off your hands. Thank you very much. And we'll take that. And you're you're good. Take that. We'll move on to this one. Everybody's going to make some mistakes. And no, to your point, nobody knows what's going to happen. So the the best tools that we have is that conservative underwriting and is being patient, right? There's also just this rush to like, I got to get as many deals as I possibly can and just put them on paper and like grow our company. We're going to grow and we're, we're going to grow rapidly, but we're going to grow in such a way that we know we can, we can lift it up. Yeah, that is one thing that I'm noticing now. Um, you know, obviously I'm, I'm newer in the industry. I've only been in for like three, going on three years now. And it is fascinating to see the difference between those who there's a few categories. You have those who try to scale too quickly, right? Like doing acquisitions and then don't have their own internal infrastructure, you know, asset management, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Uh, those who do it right, you know, 
scale quickly or just just scale correctly and then you have those who uh do it like just you know try to keep everything in-house and don't actually know what they're doing don't partner and it's fascinating to see right now like you said the tide goes out you see who's naked whatever whose boats yep. whatever you know there's like eight different sayings <laughs> related <laughs> to the tide boats. Related to the tide, but um, it's going out now and we're seeing who's standing there, who's standing there naked. And it sounds like your guys' approach has been conservative. Yeah. I I mean, but I also think that comes with experience. All of us, you know, our partners, two of my partners are are engineers. One of them is my brother, Eric, there's a Shane, you know, our fourth partner, John is a salesman. He sells kombucha and, and they've seen the the change. (laughs) Dude, that that is also amazing. Like the data that dude gets on emerging markets is fantastic. It's, it's, it's money. Uh, but I think, and also coming from where I come in events, like we make plans on plans on plans on plans. Like when things, like I said, it's an, an attitude of it's not if it is definitely when something's going to go wrong and how do we prepare for that? Right? Like the, the volume of times that we've stood and said, okay, here's our plan a and then plan B. I told a story. I was on Hunter's podcast about, we had a hurricane come through two days before we're producing this race in New York. And because you have the right attitude you have the right mindset and you also have the right plan set like everything that we've put in place we have the ability to go back lift this back up and produce so we approach it in the same way so we take this all right we think that it can be here this is our performance we would love for it to be there this is where we think that it, it can cruise when things go wrong when things go right this is if there's bumps in the road we think this is where we're going to go and that's what we talk about that's what we you know you never make promises but that's where a lot of our metrics come from when we're looking down the road is that like even keel, if we get some bumps in the road, we're going to be fine. Our, we're always shooting for this, right? But that's where a lot of people get in trouble too. It's like, you know, 4,200% IRR and like, you get to get it. Like, it doesn't, right. There, there's a place in time where that worked, but now it's like, let's, I think conservatively, investors have to take a look at what's real. I think sellers have to take a look at what's real and be like, okay, cool. I'm, I'm good right here. As long as we're growing like eight, 10, 12%, we're in good shape, man. We're doing X, Y, and Z. We're going to be just fine. And we're all going to grow together. And I think it's just like taking that cumulative breath of the world's not on fire, but also like, it's not, it doesn't have rocket fuel either more. Like, let's just stay the course and keep going. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I completely agree with you. It is fascinating. You know, you look around and you know, those that, those that aren't panicking, it's like anything else, right? Like I was a boy scout, right? And they teach you, you know, whenever you're in a survival situation, number one thing, don't panic, yep. right? And that's what's happening right now, right? There are people who are struggling to survive. And then there are those who are just like, okay, you know, we're going to face whatever problem comes our way when it comes our way, if it does, yep. right? And and that's all you can do is you can, you know, ideally set your portfolio up so you're never over levered. I think a lot of people are obviously kind of learning that the hard way. And, you know, that way you can just weather whatever storm. And, you know, if you're taking this time to learn that and assess that, then what's going to happen is when the economy corrects itself and things start going, you're just going to hit that rock chip and it's going to be like a hockey stick. And we're all going to be enjoying those, you know, three year full cycle, two and a half X, you know, 26 IRRs again. The thing, Hopefully, man, it's, we'll buying when it's tough is is not a bad place to be. It, no. But you said it. It's like the, the patience aspect of what's going on here is so incredibly important. And I, I read this the other day, and I, I wish I was smart enough to remember exactly where it came from. But there's a study that was done about the volume of things that people worry about actually coming to fruition. Like some, some crazy number, like 79% of what people worry about doesn't ever actually come to fruition. And then the respondents of this survey I think there was a 10% on top of that of when the things did go wrong, they were actually thankful for when some things went wrong. They learned from it or they got better or it presented an opportunity that wasn't available to them in the past or they didn't realize that that problem would present that opportunity. And I, I think that gets said, but also sort of overlooked a lot is that this is going to be a huge opportunity. Whatever this is, we wait, be patient, don't freak out because we don't know what's going to happen exactly, right? But we can take advantage of what happens as it comes. And I do think that there are going to be some opportunities. And I do think that when we are like, okay, yes, you are over levered. We are prepared. We have investors. We are very interested in this property. Let's help each other out. Like it's as simple as that. Absolutely. 
Have you had to field any investor calls with these bank collapse or anything like that kind of ease? I haven't personally, no. Um, fortunately, we, we're pretty lucky to have some savvy folks that we work with. Um, you know, the biggest thing I think people are concerned about right now is just like, there's so many talking heads and so much what if. The run on the bank thing was interesting. I think that, you know, like it or hate it, the Fed stepping in and guaranteeing with the FDIC was a move. It's a, it's a publicity move, right? It's like yeah. basically everybody calm down. I don't, whether it's right or not, it is a publicity thing. Like everybody, it's going to be okay. If people can take a step back and relax, it's a, in my opinion, COVID was crazy. You know, there's a lot of bad things came out of COVID, but there's a lot of amazing things that came out of COVID also. And people realizing right. what you really need. I think this is sort of a mini blip in the same things. Like people taking a look in the mirror, it was so profitable and so accessible for so long. And people in COVID, like, and I know you've seen the graph, but the volume of people that saved money during COVID and the volume of debt that went way down just from taking that, that breath. And then all of a sudden it was on fire. So everybody's spending again. And now consumer debt's really high. And now all the savings are super low. I think this is just going to have to be one of those mellowing and coming back to set. Like we have to reset. This is what's going to happen. People have to reset. The economy has to reset. Yeah, completely agree. Could not agree more. It's really a necessary, I mean, the market goes in cycles for good reason, right? And we just happen to be in, in a, bit of a down spot, but it's yeah. necessary. Like you said, right. Things have to come back to earth. Certainly asset prices need to that. I think will, I think that will start to correct itself. Once we have a clear idea of what the fed wants to do. Yeah. Uh, there was a potential for them to hike it another 50 basis points, which caught people off guard. But now with the bank collapses, yeah, I, I have no idea now. Um, I was reading this morning, somebody, I don't remember, again, I, I have to look and find the source, but somebody's talking about like out of the Fed notes, somebody was talking and predicting, I think the Fed futures is that like reduction of 70 bips over the year at this point. So that like, it's a really, really interesting time. <laughs> it is fascinating for sure. <laughs> Give us your kind of muddy crystal ball. What, what, what your guys' goals are for the next, let's say for the next 12 months. Our goals for the next 12 months is to be poised. And I think that's the best way to describe it. We're, we're in no hurry. We are buying. We are actively buying. We are actively looking. We are having conversations every day about how we can place people's capital into a place that will help them grow, right? So that's, again, that's the mission is A, letting people know that this product exists, the volume of people that don't know that syndication and how powerful syndication is and the ability to pool your money with other investors to buy a large asset and all the things that go with it. the tax benefits, the cash flow, just the peace of mind, a secondary income, or even just the ability to have something out there in the future for, you know, retiring your spouse or your kids and continuing to do what you love. That's my mission is to make sure that as many people know that this is available to them as possible, especially in my network. And number two is to be ready, like by growing that list of people, by letting people know, say, hey, we don't have anything for you right now, but we're out actively looking or we have friends and we can help build in a fund. I'm like, I know this operator does a really good job. Let's help you place there, right? We all win in this space. I think that's the third thing is it doesn't just have to be me. Like if you're listening to this and I have a deal, great, come and invest with us. If I don't have a deal, I'm going to tell you, hey, Johnny's got a deal or somebody else has a deal that I think fits who you are. And the more of us that grow this space together, the more we're all going to win. And that's, that's just where, the way we work. Gosh, that's a fact. I love that. That was so well said. And it's so true. You know, um, it's all going to pass. And, you know, we're, it, it's, I feel like a lot of times people confuse investing with spending money, but in reality, you're actually more or less safe harboring your money, right? As long as right. you're doing it correctly. So that's yeah. really the education piece on our end, help people understand that. Well, you talked about capital preservation in the beginning, right? Like this, at this time, especially inflation, if you're sitting on cash, unfortunately, obviously everybody needs to have a little bit available. Everybody, there's, a, I'm not suggesting that you get rid of all your cash, but if you're sitting on larger chunks of money and in the inflationary environment that we're in, like you're, you're literally burning money. If you can put it into a place, you take that $10 in a bank, it is no longer worth $10 in a couple of months of what you can buy today. You take that $10 and you put it in a multifamily asset. And that asset grows and it appreciates with inflation. Now that $10 is worth more actually than it had before. Yep. Yep. I love that. That's awesome. 
Well, Ben, it's always great chatting with you. You have so much insight uh, and really grateful, but we'll go ahead and wind down here and jump to the final five. First question, sure. best advice you've gotten from a mentor? Always do the thing you say you're going to do. Love it. Just, and stay true to yourself, man. Like I've, I put up a post on LinkedIn recently and one of my greatest mentors comes from a place where he's, he protects, I learned so much because he protects his people in such a way that he will never do, ask somebody to do something he wouldn't do. But it's like, this is where we're going. This is why we're doing it. And making it so clear that, that you should, you just have to like be so honorable to yourself. Like you, you just being around people, they're acting in that way. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I love that. Yeah. Integrity. That's number one value that I have for sure. Uh, what is it about your career that makes you feel like you're fulfilling your why? I get to walk my kids to school every single day. That's, that's it. You know, I, I love what I have been able to accomplish and I'm so proud of my friends are still doing it. And I, you know, I miss it sometimes we still produce locally. Um, but I, I get to be here and I get to see my kids grow. And not only that, I get to do that and help people that I know grow what they're doing. So it's, it's fulfilling in two ends. I absolutely love that. Yeah. Selfishly, I definitely got into this industry because you can make a lot of money, right. And do very well. Yeah. Uh, but what you end up realizing is that you can't do that unless you help a lot of people along the way. And that has been such a kind of just, benefit that I didn't even see coming, you know, of how many people I get to help and educating. And, you know, I'm obviously very passionate about it and people can tell when you're passionate, you know, and, and when people give me the floor to talk about it, like I'll, I'll go. So, um, I love that. That's, that's absolutely awesome. Uh, yeah. favorite non real estate or investment related book, non real estate investment related book. I, this is going to be a little bit weird, but, um, James Carroll has this series it starts with shogun goes to taipan and gaijin they're just epic huge novels but they're so business focused and savvy it's entertaining it's lovely i mean i can i can say rich dad poor dad i can say all of those things but please look into it start with shogun and if you're a reader it's one it's of those like things shogun? where like shogun's the first one and what i what i usually do is like i'll pair um a business book like the first part of my reading i do most of my reading at night mm -hmm. kind of the kids are winding down I'll do start with a business book. Like right now I'm reading traffic secrets about click funnels, but then nice. I'll just finish that and I'll read, you know, I'll start with Shogun and then it goes to Haipan and Gaijin um, with a book that's really entertaining, but also kind of has that business mentality to it. it has been, it, it helps me turn my brain off a little bit, but still kind of keep focused. I love that. Yeah. That's awesome. Put it on the list. Uh, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Hmm. I would like to be able to, to teleport, man. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. If we're going to do this. One. Yeah. If I can go, cause I said, I missed best ever. Cause I was in skiing in Jackson hole. If I could oh, just no. get back and forth to Jackson hole. Yeah. When there's snow, I would like to just go and <laughs> be able to get there and get back. <laughs> what a shame. You had to miss best ever for. It was tough. I missed you. I was thinking about you the whole out. time. Yeah. <laughs> we were thinking about you too. <laughs> Oh, uh, I love it. Uh, cool. What's the best way people get a hold of you and learn more? Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, ben Nelson 303. Same thing on Instagram, Ben Nelson 303. Um, you can find us at wildoakcapital.com. We love to teach. We love to talk. There, we have tons of assets, and, or excuse me, tons of resources. Uh, we provide coaching if that's where you're at. We really like to meet people where they are. So if you're just getting started or if you're already in this game for a long period of time, we'd love to help figure out how we can help you. Awesome. I love it. We'll link down in the show notes, make it super easy. Ben, thank you so much for your time. Very grateful. Thanks, Johnny. Appreciate it, man. Thank you again for tuning in. Who do you know that wants more cash flow? Share this episode with them so you can grow your cash flow together. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you're subscribed on your platform of choice so you never miss a new episode. Go to KataniCapitalGroup.com to learn more.